Con artists of Reddit, what is the most successful scam you've pulled? Back in the 80s when Ireland started being on people's radars a bit more, because of U2 and Boomtown Rats maybe, and there were very few Irish backpackers compared to now, this is in Australia, I would score massive amounts of free booze in faux Irish pubs by pretending to be from the Emerald Isle. I was in the restroom of one using the urinal when a drunk guy came up next to me and asked if I was having a good day. For some reason, my subconscious decided to answer in an Irish accent. He was excited to meet an actual Irish person in a fake Irish pub, where there were never any Irish, not even the staff, and invited me back to his table to meet his friends. I didn't have to buy a round all night. I kind of forgot about it for a few months until I again found myself in another Bridie O'Reilly's, and a pretty girl pulled up next to me at the bar and said hello. One Irish hello my darling later and I was drinking for free again. The act became perfected over time. You had to give the audience what they wanted. Many wanted a dangerous Irishman, maybe someone who had been peripherally involved in the Troubles. For those, I would refuse to say if I was Protestant or Catholic, and would be vague about surname and employment. I'd also get evasive if asked about the scar above my eyebrow. For others, I would admit to being Catholic, and maybe tear up if asked about my hometown. One time, a girl told me she'd been to Londonderry, and I corrected her hotly, saying, That's just frickin' dairy, thanks very much. I have no idea if that's actually a thing. So I do this every few months for years. After maybe a decade of it, I was sitting in a non-Irish pub with a new friend. Something about Ireland came up and I started to tell the story when he calls BS on me. I turned to the booth behind me, interrupted the girls talking there and said, Hello darlings, are you having a good time tonight? After they replied in the positive, I introduced myself as Dylan and my friend as Murphy. Did I know if he could do an Irish accent? Nope, no way. We quickly moved to their booth and had our drinks bought for us for the next few hours. On the way home, I still shell-shocked friend and I wander past a house party with door security, and I stop and ask the guy if it's a private party. He says it is, but nobody can resist my fake Irish charms, so after a few minutes, we're inside. The highlights of the next few hours, free drinks, kissing the birthday girl, forgetting which one of us is supposed to be Dylan and which one is Murphy, the live musical act composing a song about everyone's two new Irish friends and me stealing a slab of beer, that's two dozen at the end of the night. That was the last time I did it because I wanted to go out on a high. The only downside, the first few drinks I was offered were always Guinness, which I freaking hate. But after a couple, I would say I would like to try some local beers. Well, I did my very best with the Irish there. Hope that was all right. Also, I looked it up. It says it's pronounced Londonderry, but I refuse to believe that. I just know that the real pronunciation is some funky thing that I would never be able to guess. Alas, Google told me Londonderry, so here we are. Story two. I made a fake OkCupid okay profile of this insanely hot girl I went to high school with, just to get a feel for my competition as a guy. Ended up getting 100 plus messages per day. I added an Amazon wishlist to the profile and told the visitors to get me something if they wanted my attention. Got a $280 coach watch and a $400 purse in the mail a few days later. Gave them to my mom and sister for Christmas that year. Apparently dudes get pretty thirsty. There was no real way for me to get caught. The fake profile didn't have my real name, address, or email on it anywhere. At most, they could call Amazon and cancel the order, but the stuff that they knowingly ordered and sent to a stranger had already been delivered. Story 3. I don't know if it's a scam since the people I sold to weren't getting ripped off, but I was definitely getting money that should have gone to other people. Back in the late 90s, the original PlayStation was the schniz. All the best games were out on it, and everyone in my high school was all about it. Too bad that for a high schooler, $49.99 was a lot of money. Fortunately, I'd been exposed to the internet recently, and being a super nerd, I was exposed to all sorts of early tech sites that talked about pirating like it was discussing the weather. I learned about mod chips, and how a simple chip with a couple of wires soldered to the parts of the motherboard on a PlayStation would let me play copied games. Cool. I learned about mod chips, and how a simple chip with a couple of wires soldered to parts of the motherboard on a PlayStation would let me play copied games. Cool. Too bad I didn't know anyone with the CD burner. They had just come out, and computers were still like $2,500. Getting into computing back then was a legit investment. I filed the info away, but I forgot to mention that my dad is a super nerd too. A few weeks after I started learning about the black hat side of using computers, my dad came home with a shiny new 266 megahertz gateway computer with all of four gigabytes of hard drive space and a frickin' CD burner. I immediately started hearing the ring of cash registers. Nobody in my entire high school knew what a mod chip was, much less a CD burner. I found a site on the net that sold mod chips. It was in China and would take three weeks to get a shipment to me, but I could buy the chips for $7 each. I was working as a busboy at a crappy hotel restaurant at the time, 
and only had a couple hundred bucks saved up, but I said, screw it. I went all in. I bought $350 worth of chips, 50 of them plus a couple bucks for shipping. They came in a simple padded envelope with a bunch of chips with wires soldered to the chips themselves, but all just tossed into a packet and mailed out. I had never done any soldering, ever. My only experience was watching my dad solder a couple of things a couple of times, so I understood. Soldering iron gets really hot, don't touch the metal with your fingers. And when you touch the wire with the iron, it melts immediately and turns to liquid. Fortunately, the original PlayStations had no idea about mod chips. The soldering points had literally nothing around them for a quarter inch in all directions. I could vomit solder onto the board and still manage to not cross the connection between the point where I was putting the chip and any other points. Very, very good for someone that had no training and had to learn in a trial by fire. I tried it on my personal PlayStation first. Installed the chip. Took about three hours because I had to stare at the picture for 20 minutes to make sure I was in the right spot every time. Putting the PlayStation back together took another hour because I was so nervous. It worked. And my normal games could be played with no issues. I went to Blockbuster, rented a random PlayStation game, and made a copy of it with the burner on the new computer. The copied game worked perfectly. It was on. Every day I went to Blockbuster and rented another game. I was paranoid at the time and didn't want to rent more than a single game at a time, so I would rent a game and copy it at home and then return it and get another. At the end I had one of those 500 CD binders almost filled with copied games. I went public in my school. I advertised myself to anyone that even mentioned games. I had a goddamn menu. $50, you bring me the PlayStation. With a serial that wasn't one of the redesigned ones that Sony released later to fight mod chips with the soldering points super close to other points. $300 for a PlayStation that I handpicked from Funko Land's used stock. I had friends that worked at the store and would look for specific serial numbers for me. I bought one every day and they made a profit. That PlayStation would have a chip installed and also five games. Or if they already had a chip, $5 per game. I made money no matter what. I paid $7 per chip, so $50 per install was pure profit, plus $5 per game. At the time, blank CDs were $0.75 cents or a dollar each. So me clicking two buttons and coming back 20 minutes later was easy money. Hand-picked systems made me boatloads of money. I talked to Funko Land, you know you're old if you recognize this name before GameStop bought them, and told them I would buy every system that had a specific model number, SCPH1001, which was the super easy one to mod. I gave them a commission on each system I bought. Wasn't much, but $20 on a $100 profit was worth it for them to do the work for me and call me when they got one. Then the games as well. After I had a game, I charged people $5 per game. $3 per extra disc. So Final Fantasy VII was $11, Metal Gear Solid was $11, and so on. I ran this business all through high school. My greatest accomplishment was giving my chemistry teacher a mod chip installed and Metal Gear Solid. He gave me his PlayStation, I put the chip in and gave him a copy of Metal Gear Solid. I didn't charge him anything. I just thought he was cool as hell for a teacher at the time and wanted to hook him up. The guy was awesome even before he hooked me up. I loved him as a teacher. But when it came time for grades, I got an A even though I easily should have pulled a C or D. Edit. For everyone asking, I made a couple thousand, probably less than 5k. I wasn't really counting. As a teenager, it was spent as soon as I got it anyway. It was fantastic money at the time. I was loving it. Story 4. This was totally a friend of mine, not me. Managed to get a cut off the local weed dealer's monthly profits by selling him small vials of a special fertilizer that he, my friend, could get from a special connection. Every month he'd get about $200 just for giving him a sealed package with a few vials, one for each vase. It came with instructions, three drops per day. The drug dealer was ecstatic with how much faster the plants were growing, and how much better the weed was, so he had no problem in giving me part of the profit, or him part of the profit. It was just apple vinegar. This went on for half a year before the guy went in. He never knew the truth. Well, OP, tell your friend that that's a uh, pretty solid scam. And like all scams, it is at least a little bit scummy, but this one, I don't know, it could be worse. The guy said he was seeing results, so... Story 5. I was in the second grade. I had horrible eyesight, but I didn't know it. My desk was at the back of class where I couldn't see Jack on the board in the front, so I did badly in school. My teacher had a token system for giving out extra goodies to kids who finished assignments or did the other good boy, good girl things. The tokens were these pink computer punch cards roughly cut into squares. But I never got tokens because I sucked at being teacher's pet back then. So coming in from recess one day, I'm walking in line like a good sheep into the classroom. I notice a stack of these pink punch cards on the counter in the back of the room where I sat. I sneakily grab a bunch and as the teacher read Mr. Popper's Penguins to us, I sat at my desk with my crappy scissors cutting those pink cards into little squares. Now my teacher didn't exactly keep track of who she gave tokens to or how many she gave. I just went up to her a few times a week after that with my counterfeit tokens and got candy and puzzle time and a bunch of other stuff. It was nice and I never got caught. Story 6. Back in college we would occasionally have parties where we sold shots to make some extra cash. 
This one particular night I was on bar duty and the hard stuff was running low. In a panic I ran into the kitchen and found this pre-mixed alcohol in the fridge. I started selling shots to people and it proved to be really popular. So popular that I gave it a name. Woodpecker. And I started raising the price to keep it from disappearing so fast. At one point the shots were hovering around 5 to $10. The next day we were tallying everything and I mentioned how we made $80 off this one particular bottle. That's when my roommate started laughing his butt off. It turns out I was selling non-alcoholic whiskey mix he bought at the grocery store for about $3.50. Story 7. I made fake coupons. Anything within a store with a UPC barcode I could generate a UPC barcode for. This was in college when four locos were insanely popular. I made a lot of buy one get one free coupons that I sold for those. Anything and everything from cigarettes to bagel bites to Xbox 360s. The key was printing them on gloss paper to make them look and feel real, no matter how ridiculous the discount was. They all scanned and only high priced items got turned down due to suspicious discounts. For example, like 50% off Xbox 360s. I even had a barcode scanner at home that I tested them with. It got to be such a huge thing that it made the local news and then I stopped. You could learn a lot of cool slash illegal stuff on the internet when you're bored during summer break surfing 4chan. Uh, just my own narrator's little hat in the ring here for 4chan. You could also just be permanently traumatized from it. As someone who frequented it, way too young and too often, it's not worth it. For all the cool stuff, there's just too much bad, man. I couldn't get past it. It made me real edgy for a time and I regret it for sure. Story 8. Throw away for obvious reasons. It all started on IMVU. Some of you might know about this site. It's a chat room for teens and adults. You get a little avatar. I had bad luck on this site. I was around 14 and I decided to make a female avatar to trick guys into cybering with me and then make fun of them. Well, then I learned I kinda liked it. A few years go by and I'm doing it on a different site. This time I'm a 16 year old girl. I meet this man who wants to be financially dominated. I figure this is my lucky day and do so. Making fun of him and he starts buying me stuff on Amazon and shipping it to my house. Honestly, I don't know how I got away with it because I gave him my real name, saying it was the girl's boyfriend. He wanted to cam, but obviously I could not do that. I'd been photoshopping pictures of random girls to look like this person I was pretending to be, going so far as to put fake sticky notes with his name on them. Eventually, we cut it off because I was asking for too much money. I retired the girl and started using a different one. Lo and behold, he messages the new girl, and somehow I get him to believe I'm the original girl's cousin, and that the two fake girls I made up were having an inappropriate relationship within the family. He started buying more stuff for a while, and then we cut it off again. I don't do that anymore. Story 9. I'm no con artist, but there was a time many years back when I had no choice but to run a con. If I didn't run this con, me and my friend would have never enjoyed as much Taco Bell as we did. I went to a small college in the far north. There was a guy who used to hang out at the edge of our group who talked constantly about loving drugs, Hunter S, etc. There were few drugs around to be had, but we would take a few of the vitamin C's we had in our dorm room and occasionally sell them to him for a few bucks, claiming they were something else, and then go get Taco Bell. Our master caper was one night we needed a lot of Chinese food, so we ground up all the baby laxative that my roommate had been given by his mother because his tummy was off and sold it to Phil as blue coke as the chopped up pills were blue. That was some great Chinese food and it only ran us 40 bucks. Phil later reported he had been up for days on a coke binge. I imagine he was up for at least some reasons. 10 out of 10 would sell Phil drugs again. His immune system rocked and he was regular. Story 10. Free movies and theaters in high school. Me and a friend realized that theaters will give you a refund as long as the movie hasn't started yet, even if the ticket is ripped. We also realized that the person ripping the tickets gave less than zero craps about their job and would rip a ticket without even looking at the movie time. Put these two together and you can go to the theater, buy a ticket for a movie that starts in three hours, walk in, get it ripped, and go see any movie you wanted. After your movie is done, you just go to the counter and make up some excuse for why you can't go see the movie. They give you a full refund and you walk out of there, zero money spent. Also, you can get the really nice fancy seats for free. Story 11. There's a very clever scam in EVE Online that will make you a ton of space bucks when someone falls for it. There are two ways to trade items in EVE, contracts and the general market. On the left, you have an item for trade on a contract. On the right, you have the general market window showing buy orders for the same item at a substantially higher price than the contract. To the average person, it looks like you can buy the item on contract, then sell it to the buy order on the general market and make a profit of roughly 2 billion ISK, which would translate to around $40. In this video game, that's quite a lot of money. However, you will never see any of it if you fall for this particular scam. A general market buy order is essentially like a Craigslist or eBay ad saying, I want to buy this thing and here's what I'm willing to pay for it. When you put up a buy order, the game requires that you put up enough money in escrow to complete the transaction. If you want to buy something that costs 4 billion, 
you need to have 4 billion in your wallet to cover the cost. However, there is a skill in the game called margin trading, which allows you to post only a portion of the escrow value. When this skill is trained to its max level, you only need to post about a quarter of the value of your buy order. The rest of the money is withdrawn from your account at the time of sale. The scam works like this. The scammer places a buy order for a rare item like the one shown above, but using the margin trading skill, they only need to put up a quarter of the money. They then drain that character of all other money. When someone sees this contract, they'll buy it, then attempt to sell the item to the buy order at a profit. The transaction will then fail, because the scammer has no more money in their wallet. They only had enough for the 25% escrow required by their margin trading skill level. And boom, the scammer just made 4.5 billion isk. What makes this particular scam even more diabolical is that the victim, having now just wasted 4.5 billion isk on an item they never wanted in the first place, sees there's a second one for sale on the general market. There is also another buy order on the general market for this item. However, it has a minimum requirement of two units to complete the sale. Our victim then buys another one of these items to sell to the second buy order so they can recoup their losses, essentially doubling down. That transaction then also fails, because the other buy order for the pair was also created using the same trading skill explained above. All of these orders, the contract, the buy orders, and the general market sell order were created by the scammer. The actual value of this item is somewhere around 500 million isk, roughly $10. The scammer has net a profit of around 10 billion isk, or $200. As with all scams, if it looks too good to be true, it is. I'm glad I never got into EVE. There have been some times where I've been like, oh, maybe, maybe, it's like a mix between the Counter-Strike trading I used to do and World of Warcraft that I used to play, and in my mind I'm like, maybe I would like it. But no, I would have fallen for this, I would have been upset, and I probably would have cried as a child. So it's a positive that I didn't. Story 12. Over a decade ago, a universally despised company whose name I shall omit was offering people one iTunes song worth 99 cents for their email address so they could spam market their products to them. The way it worked was that they sent you an email and you had to click the link to confirm that the email was valid. Then they sent you a gift code for one song. The way they checked you hadn't done this more than once was through cookies. God bless their hearts. Deleted the cookie, blocked the website from setting new cookies, opened dozens of free email accounts, automated the sign-up process via macros, and had three computers running 24-7, getting about 15,000 codes, until they ran out after a couple of days. I had to spend many dozens of hours selling bundles of codes on eBay at a 30% discount, so it ended up requiring quite a bit of work on my part. But I did end up clearing $10,000 after a few months, and used it to take my then-girlfriend on a trip to New York. No regrets. Story 13. I will tell you a story. In the 1980s, my country was ruled by a military regime headed by a general called IBB. A very brilliant and charismatic guy, but ruthless and totally amoral. For some reason, Gaddafi of Libya got it into his head that IBB in Nigeria was a continental competitor, and did everything to score points in this game of one-upmanship. So unheralded by the press, there existed a rivalry and cold war between the leaders of both nations. Enter the Nigerian prince. Not actually, but the predecessor of the fake half-assed variety you find on the internet today. These people were hardcore scammers, and one group led by a 30-something charismatic leader named Fred came up with a plan. They put together some documents and armed with a credible backstory that gave them fake identities as middle-level army officers, approached intermediaries who eventually set up a meeting with Gaddafi himself in Libya. They sold a plan to Gaddafi to overthrow the Nigerian junta and put in place a government headed by their group, which of course would be less hostile to Libyan interests and aspirations much less hostile, as in vassal state level of cooperation. But to successfully remove an entrenched dictator like IBB, many arrangements had to be made. Weapons had to be purchased and key people bribed to look the other way, yada yada. Gaddafi bought the idea and signed off the required amount, in the millions of dollars. Stage 1 complete. But there was a problem. Did I mention IBB was a really bad motherfricker? What would happen when his intelligence agents got wind of the plot? Fake or not, it would not bode well for anyone involved. Well, these guys were no fools and had a plan to deal with that, too. They flew back to Nigeria and arranged an audience with the president where they confessed to everything, and even presented the funds wired to them as evidence of loyalty. The president is so impressed with them that he not only allows them to keep the money, but also makes them a gift of his own for pulling one over his arch rival. If that's not badass, then redefine the term. Story 14. So I'm a science fiction author, right? I get invited to conventions to talk on panels. Some panels I know topics, some I barely know, and a few is like, what the hell am I on this panel for? My friend Eric was hosting a panel. I was leaving a previous panel that had just ended when Eric showed up, sat down, grabbed my arm, and said, please stay. I asked him, why? And he said he was nervous, he had never hosted a panel before. I said he'd be fine, but he was pleading. 
You don't have to say anything. Just sit here with me. Uh, okay. What was the panel on? Robert Heinlein. Now, for no other reason than circumstances, I never read much Heinlein. I had read three books of his, but I had not read him since I was a teenager. I was not what you would call any sort of expert, or any sort of person who understood any of his works beyond Stranger in a Strange Land and The Cat Who Could Walk Through Walls, which I will admit I only got because there was a geisha in an astronaut suit on the cover and that seemed wicked cool when I was 14. I explained this to Eric, who told me, it didn't matter. I was just needed for support. Okay, I didn't really have anything else going on, and he was a friend of mine. I would get him started and then probably leave in the first few minutes. As his panel starts, Eric turns an alarming shade of pale. His arms shaking, he starts getting covered with a cold sweat, and he can barely introduce himself in the panel. Before, he excuses himself and runs out of the room. That left me alone in front of about 50 or 60 Heinlein fans, all eagerly looking at me to start a panel about their favorite author. Well, I found myself in one of the many absurd positions that a D-list author finds himself at a science fiction convention, which he only attended because he wanted to hang out with his friends in the lobby and perhaps eat free cheese and crackers in the green room. Luckily, I had studied improv for several years while working for a comedy group based out of UMCP. That dark comedy part of my mind asked, what is the absolute worst thing I could say right now and how would I get out of it? I leaned back in my chair introduced myself and fully admitted I'd only read two books of his as a teenager, and that I was not impressed with him as an author, and frankly, I thought he was overblown, and generally fell into luck writing a book at the right time when anybody could have become a famous big crab in the tiny title pool of early science fiction. This one guy in the front row turned red with anger. He was shaking and his arms got all tense. I'd probably insulted his greatest hero, so I called him out on it. Now, this guy in the front row seems to have taken umbrage with my statement, and I want to hear what he has to say about it. Boy, did he let me have it. He told me why he thought Heinlein was great. This caused another audience member to disagree with a few of his statements. I asked her to clarify what she meant by a few things she said. Then the other guy started a counteraction with his statements. A few more audience members joined in. After about 15 minutes, I had at least four audience members talking about what they knew about Heinlein, and what they thought about his works, and all I did was ask questions based on the last few sentences they might have said, or tying it back with the disagreement that was made earlier. Eventually, I was doing nothing but moderating various random people in the audience, and very quickly, the hour ran out. When everybody was leaving the room, a few audience members shook my hand and said it was the best Heinlein panel they had ever been on, and they appreciated my clever introduction, and said that Heinlein would have surely approved my fake anti-Heinlein stance. Wink wink. Nobody had any idea. Later, Eric egregiously apologized for running away, and said he spent the hour throwing up in the lobby restroom because he lost his nerve with stage fright. But he heard the panel went really well and thanked me for covering his butt. Now, I say this with all the love in my heart because I'm a nerd, but there is nothing that nerds love more than correcting people. OP struck gold with this. Get a bunch of people in a room wanting to hear about their favorite author. Tell them their favorite author is garbage. They'll have a discussion themselves. OP, you're a genius. Story 15. When I was a senior in high school, our soccer team was pretty good. We weren't usually this good, so the home crowd usually consisted of family members of the team and other faculty. My friends and I eventually got up a large mob of students that would regularly come to soccer games, making the crowd much bigger. We made ourselves known to the region and the other teams we played as the team with the really obnoxious student section. We would do everything we could to mess with the other team. We looked up the roster for each team so we could use their names in the insults we screamed. We even had two or three guys that were from the band that would come and literally blast their horns as loudly as they could right before someone from the other team kicked the ball. No music, just a loud car horn type noise. We got so into messing with the other teams that we decided to take it one step further and mess with one of our upcoming opponents, who we didn't particularly like. We created a fake Facebook profile of this hot girl whose pictures we found on an obscure website, not the front page of Google so as to make the pics harder to look up. The profile was incredibly believable. We were proud of it. We started friend requesting a lot of people from the school that we were about to play and made the profile look like the girl was from out of town, or homeschooled, I can't remember which, but that she was transferring in as a new student to that particular school. We added girls and guys alike to make it seem more legit. Of course, as we were hoping, the profile's inbox was flooded with messages from guys. The typical, hey girl, you're pretty hot, blah 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 type of messages. We started messaging a couple of these guys back. Yes, it did feel weird, FYI, posing as a girl on the internet. We started with small talk, saying how we were transferring in and whatnot. We even got lucky and had a member of the school soccer team be one of the guys we were fake messaging. The conversations, like we were aiming for, eventually took a turn for the more romantically slash intimately themed, which fed right into our trap. We had these guys hooked. 
Seriously, it's crazy what some guys will do for a girl they've never met before outside of the internet. We tested the waters first by setting up fake meetups with some of the guys at certain times of night as a sort of show me around the area type of thing. We looked up a map of their area and even planned out exactly where and what time they would meet. Of course, our fake girl would always stand them up. The thing was, it didn't even throw the guys off. All we had to do was send a message saying, Hey, sorry, my dad ended up not letting me go out last night, sorry, and kept the scam going. Some of their people began seeing through the profile eventually, leading to the creation of a Facebook group called something to the effect of, Girl's name isn't a real person. This did not keep us from finishing what we started, though. The biggest part of the whole operation came from the week right before our matchup with the opposing school. On different days, we set up two guys, one of them being the player from the team, to make dinner reservations and to pre-order our meals right before she arrived at some of the nicer restaurants in their area that we looked up. Needless to say, our girl never arrived. We made these work by saying that the girl's parents wouldn't let her have a cell phone either. So these poor saps ended up paying for a date by themselves. To top it all off, when time came for the game, it was an away game so they had a sizable student population in attendance, one of the guys in our student section made a poster with the girl's picture and name, revealing she was fake and their school had been trolled by ours. The reaction was priceless. We ended up getting a lot of online threats because of it, which eventually led us to changing the girl's profile to a Taco Bell ad. Best scam I've ever been a part of. Maybe I'm too much of a sappy romantic here, but I think this is a really, really mean prank to pull. That being said, screwing with guys who are clearly, I don't know, way too focused on intimately texting someone they've never met before, just on the internet, who they think is really hot or whatever. Like, I get the appeal of doing something like this, and it is a bit satisfying, I guess. But I don't know. It is a lesson that the guys should learn, though, of don't trust everyone on the internet. Personally, I think it went a little too far when you're, like, actually making them lose money for it. Like, if these are nice restaurants, they might be out $100, which could be a big deal for high school students. I don't want to take away from how insane of a prank this is, though, for a rival school. Like, that's... it's insane and kind of awesome. But I do think it went a little too far, but maybe I'm just a party pooper, I don't know. Story 16. Back in the day before cameras were watching every move, I was a cashier at a restaurant. I wanted to be a waitress, that's where the real money was. Tips. But they said I was too good as a cashier to move. Okay, no problem. I'll get extra money a different way. The cashier was also in charge of selling baked goods. So I would sell the cookies, take the money, put it into the register, but not ring it up. Kept a running tally of the extra money in the till. But then how to safely remove the extra cash from the till. Well, in a separate procedure, when a customer would add a tip onto their credit card, the cashier was to take the corresponding amount of the cash out of the till, and then put it in a tiny manila envelope marked with the wait person's name, and give it to them at the end of the night. So la-di-da, toward the end of the night, I would just take out all the extra cash from unwrung cookies, put it in a manila envelope, mark it with a wait person's name, and put it with the other envelopes. At the end of the night, it stayed in my apron while all the other envelopes got handed out. I figured if I was ever caught with it, I would just say, oh, I meant to give this to X wait person, but happily, I was never caught. I taught my friend slash coworker to do it too, and the only problem that arose was when we worked the same shift. We'd argue about who got to steal that night. We only stole about $20 per shift, so they wouldn't notice any substantial decrease in bakery sales. The extra cash and the brownies pilfered from the walk-in fridge. That job was good to me. No, <laughs> OP, OP, this isn't a scam. You, as you said in your own post, you did just steal. And I don't, I don't know how to feel about it. I really don't. If this was like a small town bakery kind of deal, I think, <laughs> I think you're kind of a jerk. If it's a bigger store, like kind of whatever. But like, you did just steal here. This was not a con. Story 17. Put my Benz on Craigslist for $2,000. This tweaker calling himself Peter Parker shows up with a thousand cash and says, Can I give you this grant now, then take the car and pay you later? I said, uh, hell no, sir. But I will gladly hold your grant while you get the rest, and I'll give you the car once you return with the other. For some reason, he agrees. I'm a good guy for the most part, so I wait for him to return. Days go by and none of his phone numbers work, except one which is a motel an hour away. So I said screw it and put the car back on Craigslist. I find a buyer and they pay me the money we agreed on, and life goes on. I essentially sold the car twice. Fast forward about 50 days and I get a call from the cops saying some guy named Peter Parker has accused me of stealing his car and money. I flat out tell the cops the story and inform them that the thousand dollars is long gone, because I never thought I would hear from him again. They were all like, hmm, well, is anything in writing? No. Well, we'll ask him if he wants to take you to court over it, but as far as we're concerned, you didn't steal anything. He gave you money and never got the car, and it's history. Also, we have problems with this guy all the time, so let's just move on. That was the end of it. Never heard from Peter Parker again. Story 18. Used an old hack of World of Warcraft guild forms to get people's passwords to that website. They often used the same password for their email. Then you recovered their WoW account. Once you had the account, the fun started. 
you'd log in and start advertising you had the WoW trading card game Spectral Tiger card, which you could use to get an in-game mount, and people would start chatting you. You'd get three to seven different chats going, convince the buyer to pay you half before the trade, then you'd work the rest of the crowd while telling anyone who's already paid you half you were taking a photo. Stall like hell to make some other trades. If you got lucky, the account you logged into had a few tens of thousands of gold. One account had 250k. Once people found out you were a fraud, you'd sell all the equipment and crap the account had for extra gold, then go to a Chinese gold buying website and sell it off at five to six dollars per thousand. My friend did this throughout one summer and made enough money to buy a six thousand dollar car and then some. Okay, maybe it's because I'm a World of Warcraft player, but this one, like, really sucks? These victims did not do anything wrong. It sounds like OP and his friend exploited a vulnerability in a website and essentially committed identity theft, I think? Like, I'm almost certain this is illegal. This one's kind of super messed up. Maybe that's just me, but I don't think so. Story 19. When I was younger, I found a way to get paid 10 to $12 an hour to play and eat loads of cheese. In junior high and high school, I was known in my suburban neighborhood and surrounding area for being a reliable and fun babysitter, who is more than willing to sit on a Friday and Saturday night. So much so, I was usually booked two months out. My suburb was known for its ambitious transplants with money and I used it to my advantage. When booking me to babysit long evenings, most families would ask if I wanted any snacks and I would always tell them, cheese. Pretty sure they all thought that was odd, but desperate parents usually don't ask questions. And when I was known for showing up on time and came highly recommended from their friends, nine out of ten times when I arrived on their doorstep there would be cheese waiting for me in the fridge. All in all, everyone got what they wanted. Parents got a worry-free night out, the kids had a good time. I got a tax-free salary and a crisper full of delicious cheese, and, well, it wasn't really a scam, but I still felt like I was pulling one over on the parents. I frickin' love cheese. So the last one I'm pretty sure is a crime. This one is the opposite. OP, there, <laughs> there is no scam here. You offered services, told them what you wanted, and they gave it to you. And then, the most important part, you performed those services. OP, you're not a con artist, you just really like cheese. Anyway, that is all the stories we have for today. I would like to thank you all for watching. I hope you have a wonderful day or night wherever you are, and I will see you in the next one.